Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Lynn, Modesta Lynn, uh, currently your host for this um, session. Uh, this is part of the Liberty Sparks uh, webinar series where we are able to dissect um, the Africa Free Continental Free Trade Area, sorry, the Africa Free Continental Free Trade Area, where we're able to look at the diverse ways um, the AFTA affects Africa and the different um, sectors that are kind of are linked to the AFTA. So this is a project just to be able to highlight as a think tank, which Liberty Sparks is on libertarian views and also opinions on how we're able to integrate different aspects and make um, the AFTA more um, sustainable in, in, in its implementation. So um, just to be able to give you just a brief background of how this conversation started. So the after series um, was as a way of just um, raising awareness about the agenda 2063 of the Africa we want, and just to be able to see how we're able to um, reach out to more people, stakeholders, so policymakers, um, um, NGOs, CSOs, and how they're able to integrate the AFTA in the, within their country, looking at the barriers and opportunities that are present. So this specific conversation is going to look at how um, the AFTA will can and will enable green growth and mitigate climate change in Africa. So this is um, kind of like coming from the conversations that we've been having on the triple planetary crisis that we are currently seeing, that is biodiversity loss, climate change issues, as well as pollution, and um, looking at how trade and infrastructure development can be able to help mitigate climate change and what are the concerns that we have in developing um, trade, inter-trade, especially within Africa, what opportunities and barriers are we looking at when it comes to AFTA's implementation and especially looking at um, green growth and development and sustainability as well, and also highlighting on the very crucial climate change issues um, within Africa. So um, we have a very great panel. I, I say great because um, I absolutely love their ideals and what they work for and stand for. And they'll have an opportunity to also introduce themselves and just um, talk to us a little about what they do. So um, on my panel today, I have uh, Boti, Betty Osei Bensu, who's from GAIO, Green Africa Youth Organization. And she's um, from Ghana, but I don't think she's in Ghana right now. <laughs> Yes, um, so we have Miss Betty, and also we have uh, Mr. David Arinze, who's from Nigeria, and, and he's a renewable energy expert. And I think I'll give them just a brief uh, minute to just say hi to everyone, and also just be able to um, just a brief about them and what they do and what they stand for, especially um, in the fight towards climate change and um, mitigation and adaptation. So I think I'll start with you, Betty. And um, David, I don't know if you can maybe hear me, you can give me a thumbs up and then I'll come back to you. Okay, thank you very much, Lynn. Thanks for also putting this together. So as Lynn has mentioned, my name is Betty Osei Bonsu and I'm the country manager for Uganda's Green Africa Youth Organization. As she said, yes, I'm not in Ghana at the moment, but I'm in Germany. <laughs> so surprisingly, you, you, you would have been expecting me to say I'm in Uganda, but I'm not in Uganda currently. I'm currently furthering my master's to the United Nations. However, it's lovely to be on this platform and share my, ins my insight in terms of the Africa, that's what I'm going to call it, for me, I'm more uh, indebted in, should I call it a uh, grassroots movement in terms of this particular initiative. So that's what I'll be focusing my presentation on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Betty. And um, I hope it's not so late in, in Germany, but happy to have you on board. Um, so David, maybe uh, you can hear me. Yes, I can hear you, and I hope you can hear me too. Perfect. Yes, yes, I can hear you, and welcome to the chat, um, the conversation today. So maybe you can tell us a brief about yourself, just a brief introduction, and if you're in another country as well, <laughs> you can let us know. So yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much for putting this together. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who is joining us. I am David Arinze. I I'm a renewable energy specialist now, but I have an engineering background. And uh, I usually like to say that my career has gone through multiple levels of iteration from being a hands-on engineer uh, who would um, climb steel, to steel towers, maintaining transmission lines to installing high power transformers to going ahead to do a bit of consulting. And now 
going from on-grid to more off-grid solutions and now working in the clean energy space. I work and live in Nigeria and I'm currently joining from my Abuja, Nigeria, where I stay. And um, in Nigeria, I work for USADF, the United States African Development Foundation, where I lead um, USADF's off-grid energy program. I've been leading this program for about four years now, and I've been working actively with the organization through its implementing partner, DDI, in Nigeria for, the past, for about five plus years. Um, working with different clean energy businesses to access um, financing, sort of blended financing in terms of debts and grants to be able to deploy renewable energy solutions, mini grid, solar home systems, standalone solutions, the whole nine yards will be in there, including biogas solutions. I don't want to bore you with, um, uh, with a lot of introductions, but I'm sure in the course of the session today, I'll be able to pick on certain aspects of my experience to add to the quality of the conversation that we'll be having. I hope that my laptop's PC will be up very soon. Uh, as my laptop's um, um, uh, camera, I beg your pardon, will be up very soon so that I don't look a bit boxed in as I look now using my mobile device. But having said that, then over to you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And I, I don't think we mind the box as long as we get to see you also. <laughs> so <laughs> welcome to my, welcome so much my panelists and uh, welcome to every single one of the participants. I'm so glad to have you guys join us and uh, be part of the discussion. So feel free to also ask questions on the th chat box in case you have anything or any comments or suggestions as well. The chat box is a free platform, um, but we'll have a session just right at the end so we can be able to just um, raise our hands and just speak um, to ask any questions or make any comments. So I want to start with you, Betty, right, um, right to it. Um, so you've said you worked with grassroots communities, especially. And um, I just want to find out maybe from you, how can the Africa free continental free, uh, African continental free trade area actually promote sustainable environmental practices? And um, this is possibly looking at also new area of work, grassroots communities, because um, the AFTA is, pro is promising, you know, trade between um, different African regions and countries. And um, we're looking at this diverse way of trade and most of it will be done by grassroots communities. So mm -hmm. how are we able to kind of like highlight sustainable practices while implementing the AFTA? Okay, thank you very much for that question. Looking at someone like myself who is from Ghana, works in Uganda and also have other projects implemented in our countries, it's a very good question for me. Let me start with a story. In 2018 in Ghana, I came up with the idea of converting palm kernel waste to charcoal brickwork. This was, yes, it became successful. However, in the course of the line, after several years, this became a community-based enterprise initiative under the Green Africa Youth Organization. So this was implemented as part of the Gaios Zero Waste Cities project. And today it has been replicated in other countries like Uganda, where we are supporting small scale businesses to recycle three tons, four tons, five tons of agricultural waste monthly. What am I trying to say? There is the importance of acknowledging the transfer of knowledge from one African country to another. There is the need for us to recognize ourselves as knowledge banks and create that enabling space for inter-country learning. And that is one way we can enable green growth and mitigate climate change when it comes to implementing the Africa. And the second thing that we can do is promoting adoption of green technologies and practices. As I mentioned, the Sustainable Community Project is currently in replication in other countries. But then, in terms of this particular initiative implementation, we have to facilitate the transfer of green knowledge. And this also comes to intercultural learnings. We have to enable and ensure that each country is able to adopt more sustainable approach to economic development. I know that a lot of challenges, a lot of different contexts when it comes to each African country's operation, but however, we have to bridge those gaps. And another point I want to raise is also encouraging investment in green industries. We should be able to provide that avenue, that platform, or that conducive environment for 
for investment between the various African countries. We have to, apart from send knowledge, we also have to send funds and transfer those funds between themselves. Rather than exchanging our currencies and doing more of dollars, we have to have that more frequent transfers and exchange between our various countries. This will enable more renewable energy pro project. You should, this would also enable more sustainable agricultural project. There's one project that Gayo does under the Zero Waste Project, which is urban green growth farming and also agricultural cultivation. With this, we're also scaling it to Uganda. And this, is, this has become a platform for us to have such an opportunity. And also lastly, promoting regional cooperation. We have to cooperate. In, in a particular country, I was, I was having a particular, a, a particular project in Mali, I recall vividly, and there was one issue that came up, which is, oh, you are a foreigner. Why would you come as a foreigner to come and tell us what to do or come and do a project here? And it was shocking and surprising because how can I be a foreigner when I am an African? And Mali is an African country. Ghana is also an African country. But you still hear some people mentioning such conversation. That tells you that it goes beyond what the government can do. It goes beyond what industries or organizations can do. But it's now situated on behavioral patterns of people, the mentality of people, that mentality between ourselves, how we are supporting ourselves, how we are cooperating. And I think if we're able to do that, we should be able to enable green growth and mitigate climate change in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Betty. And I think um, also having practical examples is a good way to also um, kind of like start the conversation because now we're able to see practically, you talked about small scale businesses um, being part of recycling and these are items that they're actually selling. So this is part of what the trade is all about, you know, small scale farmers and small scale businesses being able to actually amplify their products while also being sustainable. And I want to pick up on something that you've talked about and just um, kind of like um, shoot this question to you, David. Um, Betty has mentioned on encouraging investments in green technologies, especially, and you've worked in that sector. And I just want to know um, how are we able to have the after, you know, promote um, resources that you know develop green technologies, especially. And when we're talking at looking at renewable energy transition, um, how are we able to have the after promote such kind of technologies, such kind of renewable energies uh, being used in this trade system? So from your experience also, how are we able to, you know, um, kind of like formulate this? Um, when we look at, uh, thank you so much for the question. Um, when we look at the subject of uh, what the ACTAC has to present to the continent, you know, that there is a huge opportunity for trade, you know, across different climes. And um, working with um, businesses, companies who are very big on on technology or who are heavily based on technology you know it's it's kind of shows you where a particular need would amount from which is sourcing these equipment you know these clean energy solutions some of them in the country for example would um, already uh, or original equipment manufacturers have their patent and produce their equipment but guess what? Production is not happening on the continent. So they will produce, uh, they will design the solutions and go to other parts of, uh, of the world to go and produce and come back and sell. You know, and you have this going across different countries of, of the globe and even beyond those who have like an indigenous solution, you have a situation where for other conventional equipments like TVs, batteries, inverters, charge controllers, and the rest of them, a huge amount of this technology are not being also manufactured on the continent. And so as we begin to see this, um, the, 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 the magnitude of the of trade that can happen with the AFCTA, AP, AFC, FTA, if I'm not mistaken. But if we look at all of that, right, um, it provides a huge opportunity where African leaders need to be able to see, think locally and see how we can ensure that we can support one, 
the emergence of clean companies or clean institutions or clean entities who can who can be enabled to produce solutions locally and by so doing they also need to look at one the sort of um, direction to incentives to support those companies to produce those technologies and all that's one two they need to be able to also create some other incentives around import exportation you know and importation as well you may have companies who may be playing at the stage where they may not completely provide to create solutions from the scratch so they may have to import semi knockdown um, equipment and couple them up and then export what are the current um what are the what's the current environment or business environment with regards to those sort of specialist technology as well as as revolved revolve around clean energy that these countries are doing because if you do not create an enabling environment for these companies to be able to do this the AFCTA would not be fully um would not be living its full potential so these are some of the things you know having worked on the ground these are some of the things that the AFCTA I think can play a very significant role in enabling trade Another big elephant in the room that uh, sometimes uh, we may neglect is the transportation of also people, and by so also uh, looking at um, products as well. You see that for some African countries to travel from one African country to another can even be an uphill task, you know, and um, this would also significantly affect the rate at which some of the economic benefits that could happen as a result of people moving from one point to the other, either provide uh, uh, that you're transporting talent or whatever. I know at the time when a particular company um, recruited a top executive, you know, who was African and going to resume in another African country, he took working in the clean energy sector just to provide a little bit of more emphasis. It took a couple of months before one could do this or the company could get this done you know and so when we look at this subject we need to look at the fact that energy transition and all of this sort of green growth at the end of the day all of this who is being impacted majorly is the people one the people their their livelihood their sustainability and so many other factors and all of this revolve around them you know and so these are some of the things that i think that if the ASCTA doesn't really put a lot of um, gaps, you know, towards addressing it will significantly impact on the rate at the kind of success that it can record with the green growth sector and more, um, much more sectors across board. But I'll just pause it here and I'm happy to answer any follow on questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And um, there's one thing I really want, I really loved to touch on, and that's the indigenous solutions and technologies utilization. And I think that's something that we barely think about when we're talking about um, trade areas and, you know, just trade between countries. We're constantly looking at new technologies and, you know, new innovations, what, what new thing can we be able to use? But just looking at, you know, the indigenous solutions and indigenous um, kind of technologies that are already present is one way for us to start. Because as Betty also mentioned, these are the small scale businesses that we already have. I mean, in Kenya, we have the Juakali who are already making some of the materials that we maybe use in some of these trade agreements. So I think that's something to think about. And um, just to touch on something else that you mentioned on um, transportation, you know, the elephant in the room. And I wanna go back to you, Betty, and this question will be a cross board to both speakers. What barriers and opportunities are we looking at in the um, kind of like an environmental conscious um, after? Because we are talking about trade and we're talking about free trade between countries. But then we have, as, as one of um, the kind of like barriers that David has mentioned, we're looking at transport between people and um, also being an environmentalist myself, we are, you know, pushing for um, kind of like less um, uh, emissions when it comes to the transport se um, sector, which is a very huge emitter. So kind of like such kind of barriers and opportunities, surely from a green, from a con green conscious perspective, what barriers and opportunities are we looking at um, in implementing an environmentally conscious after? Mm, okay, thank you. And I'd like to say that thanks to David for highlighting that point on transportation. 
Another barrier I would want to mention would be that of limited access to finance. But then instead of leveraging or depending on a challenge, why don't we use this challenge to boost ourselves in the sense of we could tap into our resources? Here, our resources is not just our natural minerals, but then the people. How do we do that? We build the capacities of ourselves, the youth. We all know that Africa population has the highest youth, but then you have majority of them just being uh, sided, having no jobs or having no capacity to even contribute to maybe small video scale enterprises or go about green jobs. So there's the need for even for us to research and then find various means of implementing such any solution that we are looking at, whether it being green, whether it being any other type of solution. But you find out that in African countries, apart from this limited access to finance, we ourselves are our own burden. In terms of transportation, as David mentioned, you, you observe that there are a lot of tariffs in transporting goods from one African country to another. When you go to the port, before you can transfer a parcel from Mali to, to Ghana, you spend so much money just to go and take the goods from the port. But then you find us also bending the need to structure our reforms imposed by foreign aids. When it comes to foreign aids, we are very open, our arms are open wide to accept those foreign aids. In turn, we have structural reforms imposed upon us that does not enhance or foster inter-country dialogue or inter-country trade. There are lots of limitations when it comes to those trade, but it's something we turn a blind eye to and it will be a good opportunity to put the spotlight on, on such free trade. We call them the neoliberalism, et cetera. But apart from that, it's also good to highlight the lack of cooperation between African countries. It's, it's all evident in transporting yourself from one African country to another. If you don't, if you are not able to get the visa, the last time I was going from Ghana to Kenya, yes, to Kenya, and I had to book an electronic visa. And it was a little bit, it was a little bit cumbersome for me, but at the ending of the day, I was able to get there. And from there, I went to Uganda, it wasn't a smooth ride at, the, at every port you are thinking, okay, would they ask for a visa? Would they ask for a visa? And we should not have those frights within us. There has to be a lot of cooperation. We all know that the 54 countries in Africa, we have different policies, we have different priorities, but we have to ensure that coordination and cooperation amongst all stakeholders, whether it being, no, no matter, if, if, if it's going to be fast or it's going to be slow, but we should be able to ensure that there's coordination and cooperation. Maybe I'm going to end here and then I could uh, continue later. Uh, thank you so much, Betty. Although you've called my country out, I am not offended at all. <laughs> it's fine. I mean, it's, it's the truth of the matter and we have to accept it. Um, but sometimes, you know, um, we are our own um, kind of like enemies when it comes to facilitating our own movement and exchange of goods, services, as well as human beings. Um, and I think that's something that we need to really work on, especially on transportation of our own resources, our whole human labor and resources. So I want to maybe should um, get the question to you, David, as well, just to get your opinion on the same. Um, if you don't mind, please ask the question again so that... Uh... I yes. don't go over the place because it's a very passionate <laughs> issue. I don't want to start giving you a lot of passion right here, but please ask the question again and I'll give you. I mean, one. we are here for passion, so that's not really a problem. <laughs> uh, but uh, we are looking at the barriers and opportunities in implementing an environmentally conscious after, um, especially in the African region. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, just as I think around that question, you know, I'm listening to Betty's responses. You know, these are, these are the issues. You, you go into the Schengen, the Schengen um, area, and without, regardless of the country you're going in through, you can literally, you're literally a train away from another country. And you can choose to go through all the Schengen countries without 
almost any limitation. Just be well behaved, do whatever you were there for and exit when you're ready to go. And the truth is, if we do not look at it from that perspective for Africa, we we'll be, won't we'll be really serious enough about what we hope to achieve with the, with the after. You know, and so, uh, because what happens when people move from place to place? People spend resources, people broker deals, people uh, learn, because um, no, no country has all these solutions. So you may need to go from one country to another to build capacity to learn. And for that, after getting through some training, you come back and even train others who could not have been able to go. But if there are barriers around capacity building efforts and all of that, it poses a very major challenge. You know, um, there are opportunities that could have been leveraged, you know, um, but as a result of some of these barriers as well, the economic activities that could have happened would not happen. And, you know, the world is fast paced. Sometimes some opportunities come in and they are just time dependent. So how fast or how quick you can act within the time frame available will determine whether you can take advantage of those things. You know, and if it's if we have this sort of barriers, you know, uh, we would not really be able to advance as much. But while we can talk about the barriers and the problems, I am I'm happy to also talk about some of the solutions, you know, that can and opportunities that currently exist, you know, more opportunities. Because when we look at um, I mean, oh, the SDGs, the SDGs have a very significant economic potential if it is achieved. If I'm not mistaken, I think the last time I read somewhere, please don't quote me, but I understand that if the SDGs are achieved, it has an economic potential of about $4 trillion to add to the world economy. That's huge. Today, in Sub-Saharan Africa alone, we have almost 600 million people without access to electricity. If I want to bring you just home a bit, it is estimated to be an over $2 trillion market. If I want to bring it further home to Nigeria, Nigeria loses $9 billion annually as a result of post-harvest losses due to lack of electricity. And so when we look at some of these opportunities that are uh, some of these challenges and these statistics, it lets us know that there's a lot of value that is there that can be made. If you look through our energy access map across Africa, you see that there's still loads and loads and loads and loads of people who do not have access. And it's not just saying, oh, we need electricity to be able to um, read at night alone or to be able to watch TV. No, and electricity is an enabler. So it's going to power health, power education, power, uh, um, whatever sector, agriculture, you name it. And so as a result of electricity, I'll give you a practical example. A farmer, a typical rice farmer, I mean, we did this a couple of months ago, uh, a couple, yeah, a couple months ago, where we, we just looked at a typical community where you have rice farmers who would typically wait three months, you know, to harvest their rice from a one hectare farm. And for every one hectare farm here, she makes about 200 to $300 after three months. And there's this agro-processing element that comes into play and that number increases to 1,300, because that rice paddy has gone through agro milling. Agro milling cannot happen without energy, without electricity, you know. And whether we achieve it through, they achieve it through clean energy solutions. If there are not clean energy solutions on the, on the table, they will achieve it through diesel engines, which of course, our climate activists do not want to hear. It's after we leave the oil, don't go the route of the oil. But if we are not taking action, and that's why I say that when we look at the subject of energy access, green growth, at the end of the day, it revolves around people. People want to survive. And if we do not look at it from that perspective and look at how we can scale the solutions with the intention to improve the livelihoods of people, we would not be addressing this in a holistic manner. 
we will just be addressing it in silos. Okay, we feel, we face education for this couple of years. I mean, we're forgetting that we also need to take, get health running. We also need to get agriculture running. We also need to get infrastructure running. And we need to be able to do it in a bankable manner. Because again, we begin to think around it. We need finance to drive this. Young people who have incredible ideas, companies that are being run today, they need money to be able to scale their operations. They need money to even turn the idea to product. Sometimes you may have even one product and it may have to go through multiple levels of iteration. And so the question is, where do they get those monies from? And that's, and, the, and all those levels and scales need to be uh, exceeded before they can even get to a point where they are now investment, uh, what I call it, uh, they, they now become more like a beautiful bride to investors where investors are now ready and happy to invest in their companies. But it takes a lot of patient capital and catalytic funding to get to that stage, you know? And so we need to think around it, and look at it from this sort of perspective. And how we can only achieve this is by ensuring that the relevant handholding is done. How can, and even now calling out the government, you know, much more programs need to support the emergence of these companies Companies will be at several stages. The youth will be operating at different levels, either at the startup stage, the scale up stage, or the growth phase. And how can programs intentionally be designed that are verifiable, that have people of integrity manning them, that have effective monitoring and evaluation components happening, that can ensure that the purpose for which these programs are being set up, the monies that are being invested, I'll design in such a way that it's not one, it's one that is yielding results and not one that's kind of, sorry to use the word, being flushed down the toilet, you know? And also, so, so we need to look at it from this perspective because it is only then that the kind of financing that is required to address these issues in a more global or in a larger scale, that's when it will be unlocked. And guess what? It will be unlocked then, and that's why you see typical people who have private capital are not interested to invest. And it's in those investments, more jobs are created, more lives are being impacted, livelihood is being improved, and people are much more better than where we are. And of course, we have a planet that we're proud of, you know, and future generations will not cause us out for not, for not, for not looking out for them. I'll pass it here, Lynn, and pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, David, and um, thank you for highlighting how uh, you're very afraid of the youth, which is, I, I guess, we're doing a good job at um, calling people out and, and, you know, holding people accountable. But um, just to highlight, um, I, I really like this something you've said, patient capital, you know, just allowing for room for people to be able to actually make their innovation into something that actually, you know, works in terms of businesses and in terms of also green sustainability. And also the fact that, um, you also there's like the other aspect of you know um, intentionally designed intentional designs for all that are verifiable and also integral when it comes to innovations and when it comes to businesses development and um, something that I really want to throw to you Betty also that's just come up from this conversation you know there's the relevant stakeholders that um, David has mentioned and one of them is government so I want to throw a question to you about policy and um, what kind of mechanisms and policy framework um, would you suggest um, within your capacity that would encourage um, kind of like an after that is more that is more established on a greener community or greener kind of like system in Africa so kind of like what are we what do we need to look out for what do we need to put in place um, in terms of policies mm -hmm. and mechanisms okay so I would talk about three points the first one would be green tax incentives I think the government can offer tax incentives for companies that like adopt environmental friendly practices. An example is the zero waste project that I always talk about, where we establish buyback centers within communities and incentivize them when they gather their plastics and bring it to the buyback centers. So when you bring it, we have a, a value for that plastic bottle. And in turn, we are ensuring that they're able to remove the plastics from their environment, preventing it from going into the ocean. So that's one way I think the government can contribute to 
maybe renewable energy sources. So if they are able to convince these companies to, to or convince them through incentive, then they would see the reason to actually invest in re renewable energy sources. This also encourage companies to uh, develop and benefit from those tax because when you are incentivized, then you know that, okay, my tax is reduced. But apart from that, also carbon pricing. I think carbon pricing is, is a mechanism where we have companies to reduce their greenhouse gas emission and invest in green development. So they will be having the trade-off. So if I am doing this, I can pay this other company to off, off take my carbon emissions. I think that way we are also assisting other organizations or individuals to come up with innovative ideas when it comes to green development or green infrastructures. And then last point I'll talk about would be that of advocating for sustainable policies and the inclusion of youth. As part of the Zero Waste Project for GAIO, we develop policy documents that assist municipal assemblies to manage waste in their district. We observe that it's not enough doing the talking. It's not enough just establishing the project within the communities, enabling that bottom-up approach of project implementation. We wanted that also top-down approach of of project implementation. And thus we engage with ministries, government to put together policies that will support waste management implementation within, within um, municipalities. And this was very relevant because right now we are also scaling these practices to other African countries. Apart from that, bringing together um, youth as 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 part of Gaio's initiative of building capacities of youth and enabling climate policies, we have something we call the Youth Climate Council. So in every country we're operating, we we are amplifying the voices of youth when it comes to climate action. We are giving them the opportunity to be able to contribute to climate policies, and it also applies to the after. It's it's an opportunity to learn, it's an opportunity to grow. And thus such frameworks or such mechanisms should be put in place to enable its implementation and its scaling. Thank you. You are talking, we can't hear you. Sorry about that, yes. Um, thank you so much, Betty. And um, I think, um, I really like the fact that you've made it more cyclic in terms of um, this, what happens for the community, for the for the person who's um, kind of like a stakeholder in terms of um, the business handler. So they get green tax incentives. And then what's the role of government, you know, in creating kind of like policies that are actually friendly to um, the actual people. And also the fact that you've touched on inclusivity where you touch on um, aspects of youth work and aspects of how they're able to build their capacity and they're able to actually create forums that they're able to develop themselves and also develop their country as a whole. So I think this is a very good um, aspect and also the carbon pricing that you've handled. Although I do have a bit of a debate on that one from a very <laughs> uh, kind of like argumentative point um, since, uh, you know, with carbon pricing, there's always the debate of, are we, you know, pushing the, um, the role of somebody, uh, of, you know, carbon sequestration to somebody else. But that's a conversation for another day. Um, but I want to touch on something you've mentioned on inclusivity, especially. And uh, I want to ask this question to you, David. Uh, ah, perfect. I, I see you've changed, your PC finally worked. <laughs> okay. So, um, Betty just mentioned on inclusivity, especially um, working with youth. And I want to throw a question on, I mean, looking at the context, socioeconomic con context of African countries, I mean, we're all on different GDPs and we're already struggling with um, kind of like adapting to climate change. And uh, we're looking at different budgets. And I mean, we are already working on this and then we're also trying to develop at the same time. So how do we ensure inclusivity within the after that um, promotes you know, in, um, equal distribution of benefits when it comes to green growth. So we have the aspect of the economic, you know, we're trying to develop the economic bits, um, but also looking at how we're able to include every single person and also include aspects of um, kind of like green development. So what is, um, how sure. do we, how do you think we can be able to fix this disparity? 
Great. Can you hear me? Yes. Fantastic. Okay, okay good. Um, if I understand it clearly, how can we fix this disparity? Um, and, and when you say disparity, just to, I don't want to miss respond to the question. When you say disparity, what do you mean? Just a bit more context. Okay, so we have different socioeconomic situations in African countries, but we're trying to make the after more inclusive and more green. So how are we able to bridge this gaps? I know it's like it's like a two-part question because there's a socioeconomic bit and then there's like the inclusivity bit. But yeah, maybe um, just try to kind of like merge the two. So how are we able to fix that? Okay, great. I, I think um, when we look at the, the subject, you know, like you said, it's two pronged. But one thing is, in a way, don't quote me, but it looks like we have countries saying one thing, but doing something else. And would also, oh, we want a world that is a, uh, equal for everyone, equal equality, diversity, and all of that, which is important and is very critical. But if you look at even global spending on specific issues, it could tell you the habit of development organizations and different sort of financial institutions towards addressing the issues in Africa. Um, and so, I mean, I don't want to go back, go into details because it may look like I may be going a bit, a bit political and I would not do that today. But one thing I would like to say is when we look at the issues around um, this subject, I would like to say that our leaders need to look inwards and when I say our leaders, African leaders, Africa has the capacity to provide for itself. Now, Africa, not just the con not just um, countries in it in themselves, but looking at it from a more continent-wide perspective, and we need to be able to speak with one voice as a continent in order to be able to really achieve anything meaningful. You see that some countries have a different perspective to what they think their development should be. And institutions like the African Union or the ECOWAS, who are supposed to speak with one voice, are not can do much better than we are currently doing in order to ensure that we have a one, one vision, which is to elevate the typical African and to take out poverty out of the continent. And we can do that. And uh, we can do that by first of all looking at our own countries, our resources, and being able to ensure that we don't just turn our resources to or our land and resources as objects for exploitation, but rather look at the fact that when we see when we farm our produce, you do not, for example, farm your cocoa and sell it as exports. Meanwhile, you can add three, four times the value at which you're selling it and turn it into chocolate and export it to Europe. You know, and this is the kind of approach we need to see. Turn our farms into places where we can farm corn and produce conflicts that can be sold in Asia, that can be sold in Europe, can be sold in other parts of the world. Because at the end of the day, we would not be able to achieve the kind of results we need if we don't scale our economies. Africa cannot remain poor. And through deliberate actions that need to be taken by the government, today you still have situations where companies that are run by Africans today are experiencing bottlenecks from their own African countries. You know, Betty touched on something around green taxes and all of that. a fantastic idea. Let me run you through a very quick story of a company who started out in Kenya. I'm not calling you out clean. Um, I mean, I love Kenya, but 
and for we do respect to every Kenyan on the call and every Kenyan who will be joining the, um, the, the, the recording. But I'd just like to share this story. So there's this friend who started a clean cooking business and they do not import, they do not manufacture their stoves in Kenya at the time. They use gas, um, um, uh, ethanol. They also have to import their ethanol for the clean cook stove business. Simple situation happened across two countries. And that is why we also need to look inwards towards providing indigenous solutions to solve our problems. They started this clean cook stove business and they had to, every year they had to renew their license. They were paying taxes for their clean cook stoves and also for their gas. Now the clean cook stove, you want the typical rural dweller to buy a clean cook stove and continue buying the gas to run their cooking needs in their houses, to service their clean cooking needs in their houses. And this came at a price point of $80 for the stove, $80. Now, I mean, that same look on your face, but um, um, Lynn, was the shock I also had. But guess what? They moved, they approached the country to Rwanda same business model, but rather than having to kind of build them, build their, build, build the business out and want to collect everything that they can grab, Rwandan government was willing to give them a 10 year tax holiday, first of all. Yes, yes, that you can say, whoa, I can see the reaction. Give them 10 years tax holiday. They gave them, they agreed that in this 10 years tax holiday, we want to grow your business with you because you are indigenous, you're African and all of that. But in turn, you would have to commit that in these 10 years, at least you'd employ up to 500 Rwandese. They agreed to it because at the end of the day, they have a business that can employ much more. The business also runs with a level of multi-level, um, I don't want to use the word multi-level marketing, but they're also multi-level services because for people who would provide the gas and other sort of things, this is running, this is going on a, on, running, on a running basis. So people would need, after you run out of gas, you need to go refill. And they had a very modular solution where they were, uh, they had promised that they would provide up to 5,000 agency jobs. Can you hear me? Sorry about that. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. They, 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 they went ahead and said that they will provide up to 5,000 agency jobs for Rwandese as well. Who, who already thought, who may have had some sort of engagement that they used to make money, but at least this would be like some sort of part time job. So 5,000 people. And the government also told them that based on the financials, this business is able to unlock private capital. And so we would work with you to be able to, you have to be able to unlock at least up to $20 million within this period. The company was like, all these terms are literally something that we can do because we have a business that shows this potential. With also that incentive of the tax holiday, this stove, which used to be $80, crashed to $18 in price. And now they were able to, of course, get this stuff into the hands of much more customers and they are still in business today. Of course, right now, I mean, they have been on this with the Kenyan government for a long time, but now the Kenyan government is now listening to some conversations around tax holidays and all of this. And it is also significantly driving down the price point because at the end of the day, you want everyone, if you look at the gap in clean cooking states, over 2.4 billion people do not have access to clean cooking. It doesn't do us any great, any good if it's just 100 million of that number that is using clean cooking. We need to be able to bridge the gap and being able to bridge that gap, the people need to have one, the willingness to pay, but also a step further, the capacity to pay for certain clean services. And let's bear in mind that if people, people, people need to survive, 
you won't tell the person that who hasn't had monies to spend for himself or herself, say that they will not go into the, the, the forest and cut a tree and put some kerosene and get their heating done. That is what we are trying to address. That is what we're trying to fight. And in order to fight this, government has a critical role to play. You know, and so this is a practical example of what governments can do to create a lot more incentives and work with businesses that are indigenous, businesses that are led by this, that are, that, are, that are from the continent, by the continent, creating indigenous solutions to indigenous problems. At the end of the day, I believe that in order to address most of the development challenges that we have, especially when it comes to technology, energy transition, uh, uh, clean cooking and all of that, I believe strongly that Africans will provide their solutions for Africans and create sustainable businesses for Africans because they understand the local context and the local market. They understand how we pay for products, how we have emotional sentiments towards certain type of products and what guides our spending. It's not easy to be able to be out of the continent or to be not from the continent and without understanding or being part of the market dynamics to understand that. And that's why Africans who are creating businesses to be able to address some of these challenges are well positioned to be able to address them. But governments need to look in words. Our prob our, the solution to our problems are not out there. They are in here. And it is in doing this and helping address this challenge through this local, call me, allow me to use the, the word, local silver bullets in African innovators and entrepreneurs. That is how we can really address that issue. And of course, inequality will be addressed. Inclusivity will be addressed because at the end of the day, we see that we're providing a solution by us, for us, through us. You know, and so this is the kind of thinking that I have when I begin to think around how I want to address the solution and my contributions towards how I think we can help address these issues. Lynn, over to you. Uh, I am challenged and inspired at the same time. And um, kind of like just repetitively you saying that um, we need to look inwards, you know, and we need to solve our own issues on our own as Africans, because um, as you've mentioned, inclusivity and all those bridging the gap will actually be easier when we are solving problems from ourselves within ourselves, because then we're able to address if it's an employment issue, if it's a food security issue, you know, if it's an income issue, then it's easier for us to create solutions in that sense that also provide um, kind of like um, all these solutions at the same time. Um, I really want to move to a second segment of this and just be able to open the floor to anyone who has a question. Um, you can either type on the chat box or you can be able to maybe raise your hand if you'd like to speak. Uh, but meanwhile, maybe to the panelists, if you start thinking of um, kind of like closing remarks or, or if there's a burning statement that maybe you want to make um, in regards to the same. Uh, but yes, I want to open it up to the um, to the floor. Anyone who has a burning question or uh, a confirmation that they want to make or anything, just any kind of question or um, statement that they'd like to kind of like address, uh, feel free, this is the moment. So yes, anyone, you can just raise your hand and we can be able to just give you a chance to. Yes, um, Esther, maybe you can go ahead and um, ask your question. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Esther Benji, I'm from Kenya. Um, uh, practicing in policy advocacy in the renewable energy sector. Uh, and thank you for this conversation. I think it was very insightful. I was able to pick a few things that uh, we can apply now in policies. Uh, there's quite a lot of policies upcoming in Kenya. And just to concur with what David said, uh, I think most people are wondering why everyone is running to Rwanda. <laughs> Uh, it's because they do have, like he said, they have very welcoming policies. Uh, I doubt in Kenya you'll hear people being given a tax holiday for 10 years. Uh, we're just discussing our finance bill and some of the, like one of the incentives that was given last year on cook stoves has now been removed on cook stoves. So uh, 
quite a lot of discussion. There's need for more incentives and just to also add to the conversation. Um, I was in a discussion lately and someone was saying, um, if you look at Africa, the population of Africa and the population of, let's say, China, where they're big manufacturers, uh, Africa would be like maybe a province of the population. So if we uh, segregate ourselves in different countries doing our, our own things, then we won't be able to see the whole picture of us as an African country uh, producing our own uh, products and uh, having the unison with regards to incentives and manufacturing. If goods are maybe manufactured in a different country, how can they freely move to another country uh, without so much hindrances? Um, for example, like one of the hindrances we were having, uh, we had a discussion with the East African community recently, and you'll find um, different countries have their own taxes which some are higher some are lower so then now you see that defeats the whole purpose so moving together as a block will really help improve the trade um in the in the continent and thank you so much for this conversation those are my few remarks Thank you so much, Pastor, and um, thank you for also highlighting the fact that um, there's a lot of policy issues going on as well, and um, we are our, our own kind of like we are on our problem. And I think that was also important in the chat box. Um, if I if I may just read a few also that's going around. Um, I think um, one was from Cyprian, and he said, um, "Let me just find this." Sorry. Yes. Um, so, okay. So one was from C um, Cyprian and he said, as Africa, we are our own enemies. And um, Iga also <laughs> agreed to this sadly. And this is, this is it's, and as much as we do not want to accept this, it's, it's very, very true. And also um, Henrich also says that, uh, I think he retaliates the same comments on how we are our own kind of like interests um, within our own countries. He says meaningful collaboration among us as African is the key to real transformation of the continent. And I couldn't agree um, more with you, Henrich. So I think the discussion um, surrounding all this also kind of like reflects on what our role is as Africans in the different spheres that we're in. So um, I don't know if there's anyone else. Oh, yes, there's a, a question from Iga. And he asks, um, how best can we address this to our leaders? So I think um, I wanna package this together with your closing remarks. So um, this question goes out to both you um, panelists. Uh, I think I'll start with you, Betty, uh, because I know you have to jump out um, really quickly. So maybe um, you can give us an answer to this question on how we can be able to address this to our leaders because this is like our next steps uh, also. And also just uh, maybe your closing remarks as we kind of like wrap this up. Okay, thanks for that addressing this to our leaders is a little bit dicey, right? There was one question I was looking out to, which was, is like, are we in the position to even fully realize the after in Africa? If, if we're able to answer that question, then I think it will lead us to the question of how to pose this to our leaders, right? The first thing that this webinar brought about was the issue of climate change, mitigation and adaptation. And I tend to ask myself, what is the understanding of these key words in the grassroots community? Let's all also ask ourselves here, what is the local name for climate change, mitigation and adaptation? So it, you, you understand that there is a lot to be learned, there's a lot to know. And are we also aware that majority of people who go into startups are less educated because you find ourselves who are building ourselves in their education line. You have us going into the white collar jobs more often. And these are some things we have to ponder on. Secondly, that what I would also want to talk about would be the lack of political will. Yes, we have to talk to our leaders, but are they willing to bring this into play. We have a, a system that always rotates. Four years, tenor, eight years, tenor, 
And every time a particular leader is trying to do what he's supposed to do at that moment to get power. And that is several of the issues we are facing. So are we in the position to realize after I'll tell you it's 50-50. And one last thing also is the fact that we have no law enforcement frameworks. Africans are very quick to write documents, are very quick to sign documents, but when it comes to law enforcement, it's very, very difficult. You see a lot of policies that promote green growth, that mitigate climate change, but when you go to the grassroots communities and societies, it is, it's not there. You find that uneven culture, that uneven playing field of businesses that are trying to adopt to more sustainable practices. You find those people who are actually doing the damages, not paying, and those people who are not doing or contributing less, the damage is paying more. And I really love that feedback of the carbon pricing you mentioned. And then this should be my call to action to conclude. I would say that implementing the af after in, in a manner that promotes green growth and climate change and mitigation, et cetera, will require significant investment. It will require education. It will require commitments from our various African leaders, businesses, and even we ourselves. We need cooperation. And this cooperation is very important. If we are not able to unite, we can't do anything. And very importantly, youth will play a very important role in, ensure, in ensuring that we benefit from this particular movement. We have to advocate for sustainable policies. We have to develop our skills in green industries. We have to capacitate ourselves. It's not enough always shouting off, hey, this is, has to be done. Hey, that has to be done. We are demonstrating on the street. How are we capacitating ourselves to stand beside those leaders and say, we know what we are talking about and we want to also take the action. We ourselves have to start the green business. Recently, I started a platform called Be Inspired with Stories from Africa, an advocacy platform that highlights inspirational works of youth in communities. It's, it looks at themes of passion, values, and environment. And this is my own small business. My own is advocating. I want to advocate for green businesses. But then surprisingly, when it comes to registration, even in my own country, there are lots of bureaucracies. There are lots of documents to be filled as compared to Europe here that you are in school and there is a particular office that promotes small scale businesses. And they are willing to give you thousand, thousand euros if that your idea is sustainable enough. And those are the kind of platforms that, that are being provided. And thus, we have to adapt such, localizing to localizing it into our own context. And it's very, very important. And also participating in Af Afkata conversations. And I really love that, Lynn, you were able to put, it, put this together. It's, it's an opportunity to view my idea from that grassroots point of view and also hear from other speakers. And it's really a great opportunity to also hear from the participants. So thank you very much, Lynn, and I would hand over now. Thank you so much, Betty. And um, thank you for also calling out um, how we need to also remove bureaucracies when it comes to um, kind of like dealing with small businesses and dealing with also climate change related issues and also definitions and capacity building. Um, I wanna throw it to you, David, um, what are your final remarks and also your comments um, on the question? Um, dear friends, dear fellow change agents, global solution providers here in the room and those who catch up with the recording, we cannot achieve any significant development without our contributions, you and I. Nobody is coming to address this issue as much as the youth. And guess what? Nobody, no generation will be impacted by this issue as us. And it's just going to get worse if we don't take action. And so, how can we engage our African leaders? We have several ways. So 
engage our leaders. But are we going to them with complaints or are we recommending solutions? I want us to see this. Our leaders don't have all the answers. And, and that's why if you check among those leaders that we have across the continent and even across the world, they see the value that young people have. And so that's why they make them as part of their team. And we also have to prove us as, ourselves as people of value, about solutions that can address these issues. And so, simply put, we are the solution. We can tweet around it, we can love social media, write articles, put pieces, write open letters, address them to these leaders. And ensure that you don't just stop at one action. In some cases, if you have to call leaders out, call them out. But not just calling them out without pointing them in the direction that they can go, because they don't have all the answers. And we don't have all the solutions. And so when we look at it from this perspective, we'll be able to get the attention of our leaders. And for those who may be in places where you know that your leader, maybe in your country, will be attending a social event or something, and you have access to be there, be there. Get crash if you may have to. I mean, in a nice way. I'm not trying to. Um, encourage violence but if you can if there are no restrictions and you can get there sometimes it's just by mentioning some of these things and when you mention you see it as an elevator pitch oh i have this idea i have this initiative you share and leaders will go on and say you know what you tell a member of the team let us use them at the office let us meet them let us hear them out you don't have to be hostile to get the kind of attention you need. At the end of the day, you are a value carrying personality. And so the reason why you are seeking audience with the seat of power is because you have value that they can leverage that can lead to significant impact. And that's a good point, but that's the goal. And so that was how we should look at things in terms of trying to get the attention of global leaders. <clears throat> Having said that, can I overemphasize the place of good examples that youth are already showing and case studies. Sometimes we need to just amplify that more because there are People that we may know within our context who are doing an incredible job, but may not get the kind of PR that they need. A lot of people don't know about them. And one way we can also help ourselves as youth, you may have a skill of being great with social media and all of that. And this person just wants to do the work. You can even volunteer one hour every day with that person like, you know what, I can talk about your initiatives. I can tweet about it. We can create relevant content about it. And by so doing, we begin to raise a lot of news about the, uh, the, the initiative that you have run. I want us to always look at the fact that we can start from where we are and go grow from there. And so, if you don't remember anything, one thing you need to remember is these challenges are here, no doubt. What am I bringing to the table today as you to address this challenge it should be the biggest answer. And you may not, not all of us will be innovators or entrepreneurs, but an entrepreneur needs a communication specialist. Entrepreneur needs a finance person needs a legal person, needs someone who can support his strategy, you know. And so it takes a whole village to get meaningful things done. Plug yourself 
with the relevant initiatives that can provide the kind of change you like to see. You may not get paid, but at the end of the day, the real value cannot be hidden. You know? And so as I wrap up, you need to take action today. And if you're not already taking action, start looking at how you can engage with those who are already taking action. Maybe that may serve as that torch that would ignite you to better take action, better shape the kind of action you're taking or that you can take and begin to make significant contributions towards addressing the challenges that currently exist. It takes a level of resilience to achieve anything meaningful. And so it's not going to be rosy. It's not going to be as exciting, but we need to stay at it because we know the goal that we want to achieve. A better world, a better future for everyone, everywhere. And so that is the mandate and we must run with it. I hope these few words of mine have been value adding to you. Thank you so much to Lynn and the team at Liberty Sparks for the invitation. I'm happy to connect with you. I'm not hard to find on social media, on LinkedIn. My name is David Arize on every platform. On Twitter, I am David underscore energy NG because I'm the energy guy, you know, but I'm happy to connect. If you have full on questions, please, by all means, we have a future to take care of. And we need to start taking action now. Thank you. Lean over to you. Am I allowed to clap? <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, thank, you. thank you so much, David. And thank you for the inspirational words and um, the call to action as well. I think um, we have a lot to do and we need to start now. And there's so many comments coming in, um, including from um, James Kambe, as well as um, Kevin, who are, you know, calling for action as well, calling for us to educate more and actually, you know, utilize our own solutions as Africans. And there's something that Esther said that I'd really like to retaliate, um, kind of like as an idea, because she mentioned how we're having finance skills, we're having all these changes that are happening. And this is like one key documents, you know, uh, policy documents that are being formulated. Are they actually going in line with our, our plans as Africans, not just Kenyans? And, you know, such kind of platforms are where we should come out strongly and advocate because, you know, we're talking about solutions or such as green tax incentives. Are we are they actually being implemented? Are we actually calling for them when it comes to um, the policy documents that governments are, are creating? So we have a role to play. And as you've mentioned, Debbie, that we need to start now. And if anything, our future waits upon us and we can't wait. And if we can't do it ourselves, then we need to support the ones who are actually doing it. So this has been a very great session. And I want to appreciate our incredible, our incredible speakers who have been very insightful, very inspiring. And um, I think if anything, we've learned so much um, during this conversation to our lovely participants who've stayed all through. I know it's, um, it's almost the end of uh, work hours for most of most people and from here where i am i'm in thailand right now it's really dark so um i really want to appreciate you for taking the time and um this past one hour almost 30 minutes we've been having a very engaging conversation and you have been um on the chat box you know constantly um retaliating what the speakers have been saying which means you're listening and that's a good thing so um thank you so much and from the team from liberty sparks we want to say asante sana and um, connect with um, our speakers as well. David has mentioned his um, socials. Maybe you can add it on the chat box as well, David, just in case. Um, also, um, Betty uh, has mentioned her on her socials. She's Betty Osei Bonsu on all socials and very active, especially on LinkedIn. So yes. Um, and also from us at Liberty Sparks, uh, we are Liberty Sparks on every single platform. So make sure to follow us. I have been your host, uh, Modesta Lin. This and I work for different organizations actually. <laughs> and uh, my primary work is to just uh, be able to facilitate more advocacy, more conversations, and just to be able to develop um, green kind of like agendas in the different countries uh, that we are working with, especially in Africa. And I primarily work with young people. And this is a very passionate conversation that you are having. 
and um, don't forget that the after webinar series is um, continues. So this is not the only one. So we deal with different conversations, different issues. At some point, we'll talk about innovation that has been very um, uh, a very huge topic. At some point, we'll also talk about technology specifically. So keep up with our socials on Liberty Sparks, um, Twitter, Instagram, as well as Facebook. And we'll make, be making updates of um, every continuous conversation that we have. So I have been your host, uh, Modesta Lin. Uh, you can also follow me on every social. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys, um, each and every one of you in every other conversation that we have. Thank you so much um, to everyone and have a good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever you are. Bye. Thank you. Bye everyone, thank you.